top French politics. Mark Bailey from Fix Securities joins me now live. Mark, great to have you on board this morning. 39 years old, never been elected to office before, started his own party less than a year ago. What a victory. Yeah, good morning, James. I mean, I think it's going to certainly calm the, the market's nerves. I mean, even though it's widely expected, I guess, uh, you know, there's been a few nerves given the Brexit and uh, Trump results as well. So, you know, I think you've see, you have seen a bit of a, a rally in the year, although, although that was largely priced in and you've seen a, a bit of a pullback since then. But I think, you know, in terms of euro, that will certainly calm the, the nerves for the, the broader European Union organisation and also for the, the currency. Uh, there's also good election results as well in Germany um, for Merkel uh, in some of the state elections there. So again, it seems to be solidifying her position ahead of uh, elections in Germany, state national elections later this year. And then probably all eyes that will then fall on Italy uh, as well. So you know, there's still a lot of uh, political uncertainty that continues around the Eurozone. Um, and I think the, most of the focus will be on those elections, which don't have to be called in Italy until May 2018. Um, you've seen uh, Matteo Renzi being re-elected as leader of his Democratic Party, but he still trails marginally to uh, the five-star uh, party in uh, in the in the uh, kind of in the polls there in Italy, uh, and so he's got a bit of work to do there. But you know, I think that's going to be the biggest concern, given the amount of debt that uh, the government has in Italy, and whether it can kind of generate the growth that's needed to uh, continue to make that debt sustainable. We went into calendar 2017 with a lot of concern over um, Europe, in particular politics, and this this big anti-euro movement that we're seeing from many of the parties, the gaining in the um, opinion polls. Do, do markets take much heart from this French election, from those early sort of German local elections, that perhaps there is a, a prevailing pro-Europe wind sweeping through? Look, I, th I think it's, uh, at this stage, I think it certainly is going to be taken as a positive. Longer term, I think you're still going to see those anti-establishment parties, the anti-euro parties, still c continuing to do well. Um, you know, I don't think Greece is particularly solved. You know, there's still that debate between the IMF and the European Union, how to solve Greece's debt problem mm -hmm. and how to make that debt sustainable. So I think you're still going to see those types of parties, um, you know, gain ground in, in elections. And you know, people are just kind of generally globally fed up with um, the established political uh, parties and the fact that nothing ever seems to get done. Yeah. In, in terms of things not getting done, let's talk about the French economy because it's been crying out re for reform for absolutely decades now. Uh, suggestions, certainly from the early reports that Macron says he's going to take his time. Well, you know, do they have much time, France? One of the big issues that has led to this anti-establishment is, is the, the broken structure of their economy, particularly the, you know, we talk about a welfare state here in Australia. Goodness me, go dip your toe in France. It's shocking. Yeah, and, and you know, there's all, all the all the labour laws as well, and um, you know, the unions are still very strong. So, you know, it's, I think it, you know, part of the danger with Macron is that you'll get the euphoria. Yes, it's it's not uh, the National Front, it's not Le, Le Pen, and you know, it will mean that uh, France will be still very central to the uh, European Union. Having said that, a, a bit like Trump, we don't really know what policies, mm. if he has got any policies. Uh, look, the indications are that it's going to be a lot more measured and a lot more mainstream and central than Trump's rhetoric uh, in terms of the, the campaign that uh, Macron r ran. But in terms of the actual specifics, I think, you know, in terms of trying to, you know, um, re turn over some of the, the established uh, labor laws, it's going, to be a, it's going to be a hard push for um, uh, Macron's party to, to get that through. But I, you know, I think it's going to be in the right path, and I agree that you know France does need to kind of, kind of almost uh, reinvigorate itself and uh, try and drive growth through the economy. But again, we've got to remember that it is a, it is between a rock and a hard place yeah. in terms of you know the government debt. They're not able just to go out spending because they've got that cap from the Maastricht Treaty of three percent. Um, and you know, if it was that simple, then it would have been tried before. So mm. you know, again, you know, there's going to be the euphoria, and then you know, there's going to be the realize re realization of the the tough path ahead and then probably some disillusionment as well along the way um, because you know he probably won't have achieved everything that people had hoped it's just finally on on the state of the economy it's a funny old thing everybody over there for generations has known that there needs to be reform but no one wants to be that generation that miss, misses out on some of the extraordinary benefits that they receive yeah it, it's it's a difficult situation as we as we've seen you know across Europe and you know Greece in particular which has shown the light on some of the the welfare issues and the the handouts that uh, that uh, 
you know, kind of retirees do get, for example, and it is difficult to change that mentality. And as you rightly say, no political party wants to put their hand up and say, yeah, we're going to reform that, even though it is probably for the, the ge generic good of the, of the country because it's politically unpopular. And we've seen that time and time again in various countries on very key issues. I mean, look no further than our own shores and the GST debate. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody from offshore would say that is the, the simplest solution to trying to solve our, our issues in Australia. Increase GST, lower corporate tax, lower business tax, but no political party is willing to make the difficult decisions. And that is, unfortunately, it seems to be the state of politics globally at the moment. Well, let's, let's talk about tomorrow's budget and I suppose expectations around it. I suppose from the, the viewpoint of the market, but in particular, Mark, the viewpoint of the ratings agency, what do you think they're going to need to see? I mean, we talk about this, this credible plan to surplus. I mean, what does that mean in their eyes to maintain the AAA for, uh, for Australia? Yeah, well, I, I, th I think in terms of the rating agencies and what they see and where they see Australia's AAA rating being maintained. So they've essentially signed off on, on the previous budget that had a, a deficit, I think, of around about 29 billion uh, Aussie. And this, this one that looks like it's going to be put forward is going to be around a deficit of 25 billion. So there's going to be a slight improvement there. So you would naturally assume that Australia would maintain its AAA rating. Um, my view is that I think it's, it's not necessary to maintain the AAA rating. And if we don't get downgraded to double A plus, you know, it's not a big deal. Yes, it will create headlines, but in terms of the actual uh, funding of the, of the nation and funding of the banks, it would be a, such a marginal uh, increase that I don't think it would be material and certainly wouldn't be, in, uh, be able to, you know, uh, be held up as, a, as a, a real big issue. But Scott Morrison, for whatever reason, seems to have tied his budget to Australia maintaining the AAA rating. I think uh, the budget that he will deliver will allow them to do so. I mean, obviously, it's been boosted by higher commodity prices, which, you know, as we've seen in iron ore and other commodity complexes over the last couple of months, have sold off fairly significantly. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of the, the budget that he's going to propose, I think that's certainly going to be sufficient for the rating agencies to um, kind of come out and reaffirm that AAA outlook on Australia. And, I mean, what, would, what do you think they want to see and what does the market want to see? We, we've heard in the past that we have a, a spending problem, you know, the idea of not spending more than, than you're making, but we've continued to see um, debt as a proportion of GDP increase, those spending levels increase. They talk about savings, but they're still banking savings that have yet to actually get through through Parliament, in particular the, the Senate. So it's, you know, it's one thing to say it. It's certainly another thing to actually demonstrate it in practice. Yeah, and, and, and again, you know, that's the kind of the, the problem with the system that we have. You know, it's very difficult for the, the elected government to get it through the elected Senate, given that they don't control that. So, you know, the, the policies that they want to push through just don't get implemented. So in terms of Australia and its spending and revenue targets, um, you know, I think that they are obviously going to be still pretty tough to achieve. Um, you know, the... The states are obviously still arguing over the split of the GST, and there's a lot of angst. I just got back from from Perth uh, last week, and you know all, all the conversations revolve around the GST and the lack of GST that actually finds its way back into Western Australia. So that's going to be a political hot point for for the government, um, you know, when it uh, delivers the budget and see, see whether they can address that issue. But I think you know the the simplest um, solution is to to increase GST and reduce personal and corporate taxes. That seems to be. The, the, the solution that's proposed broadly, but whether it's, it's not even on that seems to be on the table in terms of uh, mm. Scott Morrison's budget, and I think that's the, the easiest solution. If you look at all the other countries in the world, and most of other countries in the world, they've got higher GST or value-added tax or sales tax or whatever you want to call it, and lower personal tax, and I think that's, the, that's a, the simplest way to try and stimulate entrepreneurialism in terms of individuals and, and companies, because they're getting more um, you know, dollars into their into their wallets at the end of the day, and also it does reduce that black market economy. You know that GST does capture all the all the cash that goes into um, into people's hands. Yeah, absolutely. The budget, of course, released tomorrow. I won't be holding my breath for that tax reform. <laughs> no, Mark, appreciate your time this morning. Thanks, James. Have a good day. Mark Bailey there from Fixed Securities. Just some breaking news.